recording this webinar, so hopefully the recording will come out and I can put that up on the site as well. If you come later, want to show it to a colleague, or for those that didn't make it at all, uh, we'll have a recording there. There's already one of our last week's webinar, which was on uh, GWizard Editor. This week we're here to talk about the GWizard calculator uh, software. That's our uh, kind of CNC and feeds and speeds calculator that we offer. And uh, what I'm going to do is take you through a, a detailed demonstration and tour of it. Uh, we're set up here for you to be able to ask questions. So just, just sing out uh, using the chat software uh, as you get questions. And I'll look for opportunities to answer them. I'll stop at all the sort of major breaks in the demonstration and, and go over the questions. And we'll try to get everybody's questions answered. Um, so as I mentioned, this is CNC Cookbook's GWizard Calculator webinar. Uh, you can find all of our software on a website. Just uh, uh, go to the uh, software menu that I'm pointing to here at the top of all of our pages, and it'll, it'll take you over here to, to our uh, software page. Uh, another page to be aware of that's, that's really useful is the, the help desk page. Uh, and what we have on the help desk are just all kinds of uh, uh, helpful resources. You can find the download links. Uh, you can find the documentation links over here in the left-hand column. Uh, help with uh, troubleshooting. We've got a, get a getting started page for each of the uh, software programs. Our user club, which is our user forums. Uh, we can come in and ask questions. You can file support tickets and look at the FAQs. Uh, and also vote on what features you think we ought to be building next into our software on the uh, customer service portal. Uh, you can find the webinar page here, uh, so on and so forth. So the help page is, uh, is a good one to know about. OK, let's go ahead and uh, take a look at, uh, at the GWizard calculator. And uh, I'm just going to walk you through a tour of it. This, by the way, is a version that's not yet released. It's, it's the uh, version I'm currently working on. And uh, uh, so there's very, very much a possibility we could encounter a problem, which no big deal. I'll just restart the software if that happens. But uh, I'm hoping to finish it up this weekend, do a bunch of testing on it, uh, fix any remaining problems, and get it out. But I wanted to go ahead and show it to you uh, just so you could see what some of the new features are. So. This is what the machinist calculator looks like, GWizard, when it comes up. And I'll just walk you through the, the different parts of the software. This, is, this top line here has a bunch of resources for you if you get stuck. This is uh, what I call the login bar. You, you're familiar with logging in. You can uh, do your login over here. Uh, ignore the test button. That's something only I get to see when I'm working on the software. Uh, but you got a button here that will take you to the Getting Started page I mentioned. There are a lot of useful resources there for you. Uh, you have an indication of what release you're on. And if there's a new or better release, there will be an Install button here uh, telling you there's a better release. Uh, you can give us feedback on this thing anytime you want, good or bad. We need to hear about it uh, so we know what to do to make the software better. Uh, and so we ask you to rate the software on a 1 to 4 scale from you know, it's not really helping me very much with my work to, hey, this thing rocks. And then tell us about uh, what we could do to make it better, whether that means uh, adding a feature for you or fixing a problem. Again, we're very interested in hearing your feedback about our software. Um, a number of other resources. Uh, you click this little button that shows a little crowd to go to the user club. The little uh, headset takes you to our support portal. Uh, we have context-sensitive help that will open up the documentation page for whichever application you're in. Uh, and then we have these little tips that come up uh, that show you various tips. And this is turned on by default. Uh, we recommend you leave it on for a little while until you get familiar with the software, but you can, always, you can always go back and make them happen again. But otherwise, they just come up uh, and show you a random tip uh, every time you log in. Um, and there's a lot of useful little things here that you might not otherwise notice. Um, so uh, below the login bar, you have the application selector. This takes you through the different applications that are here and part of uh, GWizard. We start with a, a full function scientific calculator. does a lot of things. does unit conversion. It does fractions. You know, handy stuff to have. 
Uh, this is our CAD wizard. I'm going to take you through this in a lot more detail uh, later on in the demo. Right now, I'm just going to step through it. But think about this, this component, the CAD CAM wizard, when you're working with your CAM software. Um, feeds and speeds. This is our uh, feeds and speeds calculator. It's, it's really what got us on the map and, and why most people are interested uh, uh, in G-Wizard is the most sophisticated feeds and speeds software you can, you can get and we're constantly making it better. Um, here's our little geometry applications. I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to focus most of the demo on the CAD CAM wizards and feeds and speeds. So I'll show you a little bit of the, of the geometry right here. But it's, you know, it's got all kinds of these little kind of problem solver. So here's side A. Let's say that's, uh, I don't know, two inches or whatever. Side B is three. And I enter that, and you get a scale drawing that shows you the rest of the dimensions of the triangle. So it's a trig calculator. And you've got calculators to help you with all sorts of different shapes, oblique triangles, uh, calculating bolt circle coordinates, uh, dovetails, which you're going to measure with some uh, precision dial pins, uh, tapers, you know, we got a table of standard tapers, uh, camphor drill uh, sorts of problems, right? They have a they have a tip on them, and so you want to go through and, you know, maybe calculate what's needed to uh, accomplish various things with them. So twist drill, spot drill, countersink, center drill, uh, that's all there. Uh, chord calculations on circles, these are really handy. I use this all the time for various kinds of calculations. Uh, true position points. Uh, uh, there's a Turner's cube calculator that'll get you your your depths if you want to make a Turner's cube, uh, and then there's a, a fits and tolerances calculator if you're working with that. Uh, this is a relatively new. I've, I've marked it. It's still experimental. Uh, we're we're doing ongoing development on it, but it's 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 pretty cool. So that's the geometry calculators. Uh, we have a thread database, a bunch of different threads, a bunch of UN threads here. Uh, as well as ISO threads, uh, and you get all sorts of information back. You get your tapping drill information, your percent threads, and the different drill sizes for both cutting and form taps, uh, internal and external threads, and a little scale drawing here that shows you what the different uh, thread dimensions look like. Um, so that's a thread calculator, both for uh, UN and ISO and, and uh, MPT pipe threads. Uh, Quick references. This is that's sort of the miscellaneous category. Everything that uh, didn't go somewhere else, you've got a drill index here, uh, a fastener database with common types of fasteners and their dimensions, uh, weights and volumes calculator, um, a thermal expansion calculator. This is this is handy uh, every now and again. Uh, some electrical calculations. Here's an Ohm's law. Uh, calculator and uh, resistance uh, color codes, uh, motor calculator for steppers and servos to help you with some of those calculations if you're doing some do-it-yourself uh, CNC or some motion control work. Uh, G&M code, uh, quick reference. Uh, this is a simple one. There's much more detailed G&M codes uh, for all the different G-code dialects that we support in our G-Wizard editor. Uh, but I wanted to have at least a simple one here to help you, you know, track down a code you might be looking for. Here's a hardness conversion table, uh, rigidity calculator. We're gonna we're gonna demonstrate some calculations in a in a minute in the uh, feeds and speeds that have to do with rigidity and your tool stick out and so on. But this is kind of an interesting calculator. Uh, you can see. Let's work an example here. Let's say we have a a quarter inch end mill, it's a high speed steel, and let's just see how much more rigid we can make this tooling. Uh, so for starters, let's go to a carbide end mill and we see it's it's now three times more rigid. Uh, let's let's double the diameter. Uh, well, okay, now we're 5.3 times. Uh, uh, sorry, let's double it down here where the where the end result is. Okay, 48 times more rigid, doubling the diameter made a huge difference. Um, let's reduce the amount of stick out. That's the distance from the tip of the tool uh, to, the, to the bottom of the tool holder uh, in your spindle taper. So we reduced it just a little bit, just a half an inch. Now we're 93 times more rigid. So most people are surprised at, at how fast the 
rigidity goes up with even relatively minor changes. And so if you're having problems with tool deflection or chatter, uh, this is a handy gadget to have. Uh, speaking of chatter, we have a chatter calculator. Uh, if you're getting chatter in your milling operations, uh, and you can actually see the chatter marks uh, on your on your workpiece, you know, you, and you can see them well enough to measure their separation. Let's say they're two thousandths apart, and uh, we're running at uh, two hundred SFM, and it's a uh, let's say we got a four flute cutter. So what this is showing you is a table of the optimum spindle speeds to minimize that chatter. Again, that's really handy. Chatter is a resonance phenomenon. And what these spindle speeds do is it's sort of like noise-canceling headphones. It creates an opposite resonance that cancels out the chatter. And uh, you, may, you can't necessarily cancel it out 100%. But you can really minimize it quite a lot if you use these principles. Uh, the notebook just loads other pages from uh, the web or PDFs or whatever. I won't bother showing it to you. Uh, but if you have more reference materials that you want to keep inside GWizard Notebook, it's an easy way for you to do that. Let's go to setup. When you first get uh, your GWizard calculator, uh, setup is something you definitely want to take a look at. Uh, uh, in order to configure things for what's going on in your particular shop. So, and first and foremost, you're going to want to decide, you know, do I want imperial or metric units? Um, so this is where you set imperial or metric, and it'll show you at the bottom of the screen uh, what the current unit system is that's in effect. Uh, the next thing to take a look at are your machine profiles. Uh, this is telling GWizard what it needs to know uh, to do all of its various calculations. And there's there's quite a lot of information that's useful uh, for GWizard. I'm just working off the uh, the canned profile that's in the system for a generic VMC, but you, you know, you're basically going to come along and tell us, hey, you know, is this a mill or a lathe? Uh, what's the make? What's the model? What's the taper uh, in the spindle look like? Is it a, this is a Cat 40? You know, a lot of different taper types out there. Uh, what's the range of RPMs available on your spindle? It's, again, important to know what that range of RPMs, both the maximum and the minimum. Uh, the CNC router gang, for example, uh, often has a pretty high minimum on their high-speed spindles. And so the G-Wizard calculator has to work within that minimum uh, in order to, to do what it needs to do. Uh, spindle horsepower. Also important if we specify a, a cut, uh, feeds and speeds for a cut that are too aggressive, you could stall your spindle. And in fact, uh, we have several adjustment modes uh, for the spindle, ranging from, hey, don't adjust. Let's just assume we've got the 20 horsepower everywhere. Uh, we can do a weight adjustment for small machines, uh, hobby machines, Sherlins and Tags, for example. Uh, they don't weigh very much. They're not very rigid. And what this does is it derates the horsepower to account for that lack of rigidity. It's really helpful for small machines. Uh, uh, something that's used a little more often that many machines benefit from uh, is a horsepower uh, compensation for your RPM versus your power. What's your power curve look like on your spindle, in other words? And, you know, for example, the curve often starts out with a low slope. Here's, here's the left-hand side of the slope. What RPM and what power do you get? Uh, here's the peak horsepower occurs at what RPM and what power do we get. And then there will be a, typically a high range on the curve. And, you know, where does that top out and what power do we have there? Uh, and then you have a little calculator here that will let you try different scenarios with it. So uh, very handy to adjust uh, what's going on for the horsepower curve of the machine. There's a lot of other information here. There's the acceleration time of the spindle. Uh, you can put an adjustment onto the spindle. Uh, instead of always running at 100%, you can say, well, I want to take whatever recommendation G-Wizard has and only use 90% of that. And uh, what that's telling you is if we select tool type, say carbide, uh, knocking off that 10% increases my tool life by 40%. Um, you can certainly, I have somebody asking me, 
uh, if we can reduce the horsepower, absolutely. You, you put it wherever you want to here and derate it. I've even got people that like to use more than one machine profile uh, with different curves, particularly on a machine that may have uh, a geared spindle that has a couple of drive range or a step pulley arrangement. Uh, they may want to account for different curves that way. So you can create multiple profiles to do that. Um, let me just put the spindle back up to 100% before I forget. Uh, these are your uh, max feed rates and rapids, the travels of your machine, uh, the machine acceleration. That can be important largely around interpolation. Uh, uh, helixes of, of holes require a certain acceleration to be accurate. Uh, your machine weight. Uh, we even track an hourly rate uh, for our CAD CAM estimator module that's used to help doing quotes. You pop up the, the uh, calculator for that, and it's got a bunch of different factors that you enter. For example, if you financed your machine, you know, your purchase price of the machine, well, I finance it, I put a down payment, it's a five-year loan, you know, the interest rate is 2%. Uh, it's got a useful life of four years. I can trade it in for $5,000, yada, yada, yada. And it'll figure out, based on all of this information, your operator rates and so on, uh, what should your charge rate be on that machine uh, when you're quoting jobs. So that's kind of a handy uh, capability. Your tool changer, uh, this was a tool life calculation we looked at a minute ago when we reduced the spindle speed. Uh, you can also reduce the chip load. Instead of saying I want 100% of what G Wizard puts out, you can you know derate that. Uh, there's some other ways to look at that that I'll show you in a minute. Uh, your coolant characteristics, you know, how long does it take the coolant to go full on to off or back? Uh, and then various coolant options. I've got mist. I've got flood. Uh, PCN is a, uh, a programmable coolant nozzle. TSC is through spindle coolant. I got a question about why would you derate? Derating comes along for a couple of reasons. One would be better tool life. Uh, two would be that uh, you know somebody just wants to be conservative with the machine for whatever reason. Uh, you know, particularly the hobbyists tend not to like to push their machines to the max. Uh, so that's why you would derate. All that said, though, uh, as I mentioned, there's some better ways to to sort of derate on the fly, you'd use these, the spindle adjustment and the chip load adjustment, to make a permanently derated profile. Uh, for example, maybe I'm teaching a, 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 a CNC course at a community college. You know, I might not want my students to be able to max out the machine uh, in their very first introductory class. So maybe I go through and I derate everything just to, you know, kind of take it easy on the machine. All right, so that is the uh, uh, machine profile area. Uh, we've also got a tool crib where you can come in and you can uh, specify all the different tools that are available and set it up to where you can select those tools uh, uh, over in the feeds and speeds area. And we'll, we'll talk more about that in a minute. Tool cribs are associated with a particular machine. Uh, when you use them. And uh, tool cribs are also a way for you to enter uh, custom feeds and speeds information on a permanent basis. Uh, I'm not going to show how to do that here, but there's a video on the website. For example, let's say you always buy your tools uh, from one particular dealer and you want to get their feeds and speeds tables uh, built in and baked into G-Wizard. Well, that's pretty straightforward to do uh, using the tool crib. Uh, there's a files page, shows you where you can go to find your preferences files. Uh, if you want to go ahead and back those up from time to time uh, to make sure nothing can happen to them. Uh, we have some integration capabilities with uh, some different CAM programs out there. Uh, we have a uh, ability to change the deflection allowance, and we'll, we'll, talk about, uh, we'll talk about the tool deflection in a minute. Uh, and then we have the About page, uh, which just shows you a few other random things. Uh, it'll show you, for example, if you have a subscription, how many days are left on the subscription, uh, so on and so forth. So those are the basic uh, applications. And uh, the next thing I'm going to do is sort of dive down into uh, the CAD CAM wizards and the feeds and speeds. 
before I do that, does anybody have any questions about some of these other things I've shown? Okay, good. If you have a question, again, go ahead and just type it in as we're going, and, and I'll try to look for a good spot to address your question. So let's start by diving into the CAD CAM wizards. And CAD CAM wizards are basically a next generation way to, oh, I did get a question on the, on the tool crib. Import and export of tool cribs uh, today is via comma separated files, spreadsheets. Uh, and they're in our format, uh, so you can use those spreadsheets uh, for whatever purpose you, you want. If you have uh, CAM software that can import uh, spreadsheets, it's pretty easy to take our format and you know shift a few columns around and wind up with your CAM software's format. Ah, another one. Uh, the lockout. Let me just go back over here to set up. Um, lockout is really intended for uh, shared use where you've got uh, uh, perhaps a kiosk with uh, G-Wizard sitting on the shop floor and uh, whoever's responsible for keeping all the machine profiles and everything together doesn't want the guys messing around with, with these parameters. So, you know, if you lock it, it prevents uh, the setup pages from being changed. You can change everything else, but you can't set up, you can't change the uh, machine profiles. Okay, another one, can I import Tormox tool assistant files? No, like I said, right now what we have is just our own comma separated file format. Uh, the tool assistant files, as I recall, at least have an option to go out to uh, spreadsheets. So it'd probably be pretty easy to reformat them. Um, but we don't directly do their format yet. It's on our long-term to-do list to pick up a bunch of these different formats. Uh, and I'm, I'm, there's two things that have to happen before I can start on that. One, I've got a backlog of other things I've started that I need to finish. Uh, and two, uh, I need more information on the different formats that are in use by the CAM software, for example. Okay, anything else before I go back into CAD CAM Wizards? I think I'll take anything else... Uh, uh, that doesn't come in on on setup and save it till the end of the webinar. Okay, so CAD CAM wizards, uh, next generation look at how to do feeds and speeds. Uh, if you look at a at a conventional feeds and speeds uh, uh, calculator, and we'll look at ours in just a second, it requires you to answer quite a lot of questions uh, before you can get back feeds and speeds, and in, in some sense. They're questions that uh, are not easy questions to answer. You'd like to have some help with that. Uh, CAD CAM Wizard is designed to get you a great starting point for what you're doing by answering as few questions as possible. And uh, I'll walk you through what those questions are. And then having it recommend a pretty darn good solution, which you can then fine-tune to your heart's content. So let's see how that works. Uh, in terms of what questions you have to ask, oh, and the, the second thing is a feeds and speeds calculator uh, such as ours, you know, these have dated back to the days of manual machining. And we have a very sophisticated one, uh, much more sophisticated than uh, anyone else on the market, I do believe. But it's still that same sort of theory. And again, we'll look at it. And it'll be familiar for those of you that have uh, quite a bit of machining experience. But these CAD CAM wizards are, are designed to work the way your CAM software works. So their, their terminology and what they're asking about is a lot closer to what you see inside your CAM software than what a traditional feeds and speeds calculator shows. So, so let's dig in. Uh, it needs to know what machine you're going to run the job on. It wants to know what material uh, you're going to be cutting. And we'll, we'll get into more detail on that in a minute. Um, it wants to know the operation, and this here, this is this is vintage uh, CAM sort of terminology. Are you going to be pocketing? Are you going to do a 2D profile around the outside of a boss or something? Are you going to be making holes? Are you going to do a 3D surfacing job? Uh, are you going to be face milling? And, of course, these change to other operations for the lathe. Um, so it needs to know what type of a tool path 
uh, you're looking to use this set of feeds and speeds on. And in this case, I've got a pocket selected. Uh, it wants to know a little bit about the size of the pocket, and this is information it uses uh, to calculate its time estimates, uh, but otherwise it wouldn't need that. Uh, the depth of the pocket is pretty important. The uh, corner radius of the pocket is pretty important. And given just that information there in the input section, it'll come back to you with a recommendation. It says, well, for a roughing, uh, we're going to use this depth of cut, this width of cut, you know, this, this RPM feeds and speeds, your tool stick out should be this, and, you know, here's the tool we recommend you use for this job. And then there's a finish pass. Now, you've got some options to override some of this. You can come down and say, well, you know, gee, I, I want to use a, a nicer tool. I want to use a carbide uh, titanium aluminum nitride coating uh, on this tool or uh, things of that nature. I want to change my tool diameter. Uh, I want to change the number of flutes. Uh, I want to I want to maybe not have a finish pass. Turn that off. Uh, or most interesting is I have a roughing strategy here that I want to use. By default, uh, it's just going to give you uh, uh, the results of using the same cutter for finishing and roughing. But you can come along and say, hey, I'll use the same cutter, but I'm going to use a high-speed machining tool path, or I'm going to use a, a corn cob uh, serrated cuffer, cutter uh, for roughing, or I'm going to use a, a bigger rougher, right? I'm limited here by my inside corner radius on the size cutter I can use for finishing, but I may want to make intermediate passes with a great big uh, end mill, even maybe uh, an indexable rougher uh, in order to, to get it roughed out faster, get that cavity clean of, of material. So I have that ability to come in and uh, change what's going on. Uh, here's the recipe that you get. I like to call it a recipe for this cut. This is all the information that your CAM software is going to want to have uh, to program the cut. Here's the time estimate. You have a, a tortoise hair capability to change how aggressive you want to be on this stuff. Uh, here's an interesting uh, area called DFM. DFM is uh, an abbreviation for or an acronym for Design for Manufacturing. And that's a fancy buzzword that means uh, we're on the lookout with a set of rules, uh, expert system rules that GWizard has that tell it uh, cases that are likely to be expensive. For example, if I make a really deep pocket, let's say we're going to now do a two-inch deep pocket. That's really deep compared to uh, the tool diameter that we're able to use, and it says, hey, you know, this this is going to cost you more to do this part if that really has to be that deep. Uh, your best bet is to keep your corner radii greater than one-sixth of pocket depth. So, in fact, I can come over here and I can say, well, I, I don't actually even care that much what the corner radius is. I just put in a quarter inch because it was a round number. You know, let's make it a half inch. And, you know, sure enough, uh, we have a little bit of a tool deflection issue here we need to look at. But... Uh, it made things a lot happier, and I can, you know, drop back further uh, on the depth, and hey, wow, now we're really happy. Things look good. So that's what the CAD CAM Wizards are all about. Now I have a question from somebody. Uh, if you've used CAD CAM Wizard, you've probably noticed that uh, you can put the same numbers in, and you get some minor variations in what it's doing. Uh, each time, and, and you know, people wonder, well, why the heck is that? Right? Isn't there one good answer? And the truth of the matter is, there's many good answers because what uh, CAD CAM Wizard is trying to do is maximize your mater material removal rate, your MRR, for this particular operation. And there's there's more than one combination of the variables that will deliver uh, an equivalent material removal rate. Now. Just to give you some idea of what's going on with CAD CAM Wizard, it says here it evaluated 651 scenarios uh, in order to reach this solution. Uh, and it's doing that with some really smart uh, sort of artificial intelligence algorithms 
Uh, so it's, it's trying pretty hard. It's working hard on your behalf to find these solutions. And uh, it's, it's not impossible to find a better solution, but it's hard. Uh, so I like to suggest that uh, you use CAD CAM Wizard to get you in the ballpark, uh, to give you some ideas about where to go with things like cut depth and cut width uh, in order to get sort of the best possible minimum times on your machining operations. Now, having gotten into the ballpark, uh, you may be thinking, well, okay, but I, you know, I want to, I want to fine tune this, and and all you have to do is double click, uh, double click the uh, entry there. We're a little bit tight on space, so I'm going to do that again after resizing this window a little bit larger. Double click the one you want to edit, and it brings that up in the feeds and speeds calculator with all the same parameters. And now you can actually go in here and make some changes to it, uh, do what you want to do in order to try it again. So that's how you go about fine-tuning it. You can save that result back in. Uh, it will recalculate the uh, time estimates and away you go. Now while I'm here, I want to just briefly talk about CAD CAM Estimator. Uh, Estimator is an add-on module. Uh, it's it's free for the moment uh, while we're while we have it in development. That's something we do uh, pretty much with all our products before we've released the 1.0. We we give it away to our users uh, as an inducement for them to help us test it and tell us what we need to do to make it better. Uh, but in this case, I can come along and I can say uh, I don't know. Let's call this the center pocket is the feature I'm working on. You know, I've got an hourly rate that it pulls from the machine. Remember, I showed you an hourly rate calculator, and I, I click Add to Estimate. And I, if I was to come over here into the estimator, you can see, you know, I'm let's say I'm making a a, a paperclip tray for a customer called Ask Me Acme Desk Widgets. You know, their part number is GT2000. You know, estimation stuff. I got a five percent scrap allowance. Uh, I got a bunch of data on, you know, what do my cycle times look like and so on and so forth. Uh, and, and here I'm going to be listing out all the machining operations, you know, together with their impact on the times and the costs uh, in order to manufacture this part. So this is a product we have in development. Uh, it's pretty cool. It's got, uh, it's got a ton of different uh, operation types. For example, it'll go back and compute an allowance for your programming time. Uh, it's got a material cost calculator. Um, you know, rough cutting is not yet available, but we'll be putting in, you know, all these different things. Uh, you know, I want to add uh, consumables, maybe cutters, abrasives, whatever. I want to add uh, uh, components, right? Maybe I need uh, bearings or fasteners to make this part. So on and so forth. That's the that's the CAD CAM estimator, um, and so anybody that's interested in that, we appreciate any feedback you can give us. Uh, last thing on the CAD CAM on the CAD CAM wizards is the options. So the options are how you tell us really about your available tooling and your preferences uh, for how we should be running the the CAD CAM wizard. For example, here what we're saying is, in terms of, of uh, solid end mills suitable for finishing, you know, we have diameters up to three quarters of an inch in both imperial and metric sizes. Uh, so it'll choose from that that group of things. If you if your shop doesn't keep any metric end mills around, no worries, just uncheck the box. Um, it's not available yet, but eventually we'll also be able to designate a tool crib and say, look, you can only use the tools that are in that tool crib. Uh, you know, you can limit the depth of cut in terms of number of diameters. Uh, um, uh, uh, sorry, David, just, just, yeah, no worries. <laughs> he wanted to know if it was limited to the tool crib. It will be. I don't have that done yet. Uh, roughing tool diameters, these are the, the serrated corn cob tools. What's your indexable tool look like? What's your face mill look like? And again, over time, once you get that tool crib, you'll be able to specify multiple uh, indexable roughers or multiple face mills, and it'll it'll try to pick the best one on your behalf. So that, uh, in a nutshell, is what the uh, 
the CAD CAM wizards are all about is sort of giving you some significant shortcuts. Here's the one for 2D profiling going around the outside of uh, some raised area and uh, pretty similar, relatively few questions to answer before you can get back a result. Anybody have any questions on the CAD CAM wizards before I dive into feeds and speeds? Um, Good. All right, let's take a look at feeds and speeds. So feeds and speeds, this is really the heart of GWizard Calculator. Um, and I'm going to start out with a simplify button. Uh, oh, it doesn't want to simplify because we don't have enough horsepower. Let me go back over here and let's, uh, let's pick a different machine. Let's try a Haas Mini Mill. Well, it's still complaining. As I said, this is a version in development. Let me go ahead and bump that up. Oh, I see what's going on. <laughs> All right, I'm logged in with an account that has a three horsepower limit. So this is a good time for me to explain what uh, GWizard Lite is. Uh, GWizard Lite is a, is a concept I came up with for hobbyists. Hobbyists don't typically have... Uh, 20 horsepower VMCs. Uh, they have much smaller machines and so uh, they also have much smaller budgets and they get much less benefit. Uh, so we came up with the idea to have what we call GWizard Lite. With GWizard Lite what happens is you get one horsepower per year of subscription. So for example let's say you've got a, a really small mill that's got a horsepower or less. A one year subscription is all you'll ever need because you get the one horse for life. And the account I'm logged into here has a three horse limit. So we'll work within that limit. No worries. All right. So here's the feeds and speeds uh, calculator. It, if I had been able to hit simplify and it's, it's objecting because the, uh, the cut is a little bit too exciting for it. Let me, let me take that down to a zero. If I simplify, I get this. These are really the basic things, the basic questions that you have to answer in these first four rows in order to get back the results, which are your feeds and speeds, together with any tips we might have to offer you. So um, basically, let me just go through it. it you, the best way to approach it is just go you know, top to bottom, left to right. So, you know, first question is, what machine am I running? Uh, your next question is, what material am I going to be cutting? And there's, you know, a bunch of different families of materials. Um, and in fact, I can even come in here and, you know, bring up the materials database and specify all sorts of uh, alloys and conditions. And these are a couple of features that are not yet released. We'll have a history list so you can see your uh, most recent choices, a lot of shops will be working on the same material for long periods of time before they switch. Uh, we've also got a search. There are, you know, thousands of entries. And, uh, you know, maybe you don't know uh, where to go look for your particular entry. So, I don't know, let's say we're going to work on phenolic. Well, that's a composite material, and so it's found in the fiberglass PC board area. For now, though, let's just let's forget about all the alloys and let's just let's just work on good old 6061. You don't have to choose an alloy, uh, and in fact, where it's most important to look at it is on hardened materials. Um, they're the ones that have a relatively small sweet spot, and by that I mean there's a small range of feeds and speeds that are going to work. Uh, they're more demanding materials. Uh, you know, really hardened steels, stainless steels, titanium, materials like that, it really helps G-Wizard to narrow it down. But aluminum uh, has got a big, fat uh, sweet spot. So I was just asked about in Connell. Nasty stuff. Yeah, here we go. <laughs> I don't want to work on that either. That's too hard for me. I'm going to go back to the 6061. Um, so, 
Uh, I'll let you guys look through which things are are available uh, uh, when you get when you get your hands on the uh, thirty day trial. Uh, for what it's worth, note note this down here: missing a material, drop us a line. Uh, if you can get me a feeds and speeds chart uh, for your material, I'll have it added uh, often by the next release. If I've got to do the research. I'll still take it down and put it on my to-do list. It just may take longer for me to track it down. Um, so that's good to know. I've had a lot of people uh, uh, ask for new materials. Um, in any event, let's let's go ahead and uh, let's get some of our 6061 going on here. Oh, I don't know. I don't care. T6. Uh, all right. We got that dialed in. Uh, then we've got a bunch of tools here to select from. You know, your end mills are right at the top. That's what you use the most. Uh, your indexables, a uh, bunch of different twist drills, indexable drills, spot drill, spade drill, gun drill, uh, reamers, tapping, boring, and saws and woodruff cutters. So a pretty broad range of different types of uh, cutter. And there's even more when you get to looking at uh, tool geometry, uh, as I'll show you in just a second. So let's just pick out a carbide end mill. Uh, this is where you would select a crib, and if you select a tool crib, then this uh, menu up here, instead of showing these generic choices, it's going to show you what's in your tool crib. Uh, so that's pretty cool, too. I got a bunch of different tools here. Uh, I can enter a diameter. I can, I can select, uh, you know, from a size chart. Maybe I'd rather have a half inch. Uh, number of flutes. I like to use three flutes on aluminum unless it's just really gummy uh, stuff that's gonna gonna need a two flute. I guess there's even stuff out there. My friends tell me where only a single flute will deal with it. Um, really nasty aluminum. But uh, for this stuff, three flutes ought to be good. Uh, and then here's the the geometry picker that I mentioned. Um, and boy, right on cue. John, thanks for bringing up the engraving cutters. Um, so geometry lets me come through and sort of fine tune this stuff. You know, I can specify a ball nose, uh, a normal. I can put a corner radius on if I have a bull nose. I can put a taper angle. Maybe I've, you know, paid a bunch of money to get a nice taper angle to cut the draft. I'm making some molds. Uh, I can go to engraving bits, right? These little V bits are are pretty common among the engraving crowd. Uh, dovetails. Uh, there's some special cutters that the router crowd uses that we'll dial in here uh, as well. Um, so that's what geometry is good for. And I'm, I'm adding new geometries uh, constantly. I think the next one I'll probably put in will be uh, a camphor mill and then uh, I suspect a uh, um, brain drain thread mill. Okay. So that's geometry. Uh, stick out. Again, remember stick out is a distance uh, from the, uh, the tip of your cutter to the base of the tool holder. And it's very important for the uh, deflection calculations. I've got a checkbox here if you're using a serrated corn cob rougher. Um, next row is what we call mini calcs. So mini calcs are uh, special purpose calculators. Uh, if I uh, dialed up a, uh, uh, a ball nose, for example, I get a surface finish calculator. You know, I want to be able to relate my uh, scallops to a particular surface finish and, and thereby come up with a step over. Uh, if I'm interpolating, uh, and it matters to me how accurate that interpolation is, maybe I'm trying hard to avoid having to use a a boring head uh, to get a, a bearing pocket uh, that's got to be done very accurately. Uh, this this interpolation mini calculator is really helpful. Uh, you know, you, you give it a little bit of information. And it's you know, it's a two inch uh, hole. Uh, you want to tell it whether you're using tool compensation or not, uh, and it's going to come through and it's going to figure out uh, some useful things. It's going to tell you, for example. Uh, uh, you know, what's your required acceleration? What's the acceleration that my machine can actually do? Um, so on and so forth. And so it'll adjust the feed rate 
to limit the acceleration to what your machine is capable of, which will give you a more accurate hole uh, if you need to, to interpolate. Ramping. You know, people often ask, well, you know, what, what ramp angle should I use in my CAM program? And, you know, there's numbers all over the place, uh, you know, but I can, I can go ahead and either enter a ramp angle or compute one based on the cut depth uh, uh, that I'm going to get to, and it'll adjust the feed rate accordingly, because when you're ramping, it's like it's partially a plunge cut, which has to be done much more slowly, and it's partially a regular uh, milling cut. Uh, albeit a slot, and so it's important to adjust your feeds and speeds accordingly. Uh, plunge milling, a popular strategy, uh, particularly for less rigid machines, uh, where you're basically going to do overlapping uh, uh, holes, and uh, this will go ahead and calculate your feed rates for that. Um, so that's really handy. I got a question. Uh, somebody says they haven't been able to locate acceleration data for their machine. That's actually a very common uh, issue. It's often not documented. Uh, in fact, it's almost never documented except on relatively recent uh, CNC machines. So how do you figure it out? And the answer is you need to do some tests. Uh, you know, set yourself up some interpolation. Uh, use the calculator to tell you what the required uh, 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 acceleration is. And then check the accuracy and, and you know, do uh, change the hole size to where it requires less and less acceleration and figure out where the accuracy takes a big bump up and gets a lot more accurate. That's the limit of your acceleration. Uh, Mastercam, for what it's worth, has an acceleration calculator that basically works that way. They're going to tell you, uh, you know, cut this hole, cut that hole, and tell us how you did, and then they're going to come back and tell you what the acceleration is. I've entered a very conservative number as a default, 0.1 G's. Uh, 1 G is a lot of acceleration to expect a machine to do. So uh, it's sort of proportional to your rapids rates. So if you've got a machine which is awesome rapids, it's probably got pretty darn good acceleration. Uh, you know, if the rapids are slower, you probably don't have such good acceleration. Um, so that's what I'll say about the acceleration stuff. Uh, you have the ability to turn on the through spindle coolant and the programmable coolant nozzle, both of which can give you a little more aggressive feeds and speeds. Uh, so that's the purpose of uh, those check boxes. Now the last set of questions you'll need to answer in order to get back some feeds and speeds are the, the cut depth and the cut width. And uh, you know, we got a couple of things going on here. Uh, I have, for example, I've changed that to 0.1. We have a half-inch tool diameter. If I hit slot, that just bumps it up to be the tool diameter. It tells it I'm slotting. So here's an interesting question. I got a half-inch end mill. It's carbide. Let's let's dial in a whole bunch of stick out. Let's say it's sticking out two inches, four diameters. Uh, and now I want to know, well, what what should my cut depth be? Here's where the cut optimizer uh, can be really uh, pretty handy. Um, come over here. These little speedometers are for the cut optimizer. And you want to click the one that's next to the box you want it to solve for. So if I want to know, you know, what cut depth can I use on this half inch slot, I click the cut optimizer. It comes up. It's got a deflection allowance. It says, well, I need to figure this out with no more than a thousandth of an inch of deflection. And the deflection allowances are based on what the tooling manufacturers, companies like ISCAR, say uh, you want to avoid going much above this number. Going above it is to be avoided for two reasons. One, uh, if you think about your tool, and I've kind of got this crazy uh, bent end mill picture here on this thing, as it's whipping around uh, spinning, it's, it's getting bent back and forth by that much every revolution. So if you're running at 6,000 RPM, you know, it's really trying hard. If you think about bending the paper clip too many times, it's trying really hard to break that end mill. Uh, so too much deflection will break an end mill in a hurry. And I take the, the maximum deflection allowance down pretty quickly uh, for cutters below an eighth of an inch. Here's another way to think about tool deflection. It's additive to 
your chip load, right? So if you're trying to keep your chip load uh, below some value, and you've got a tool deflection that's two times the maximum value of your chip load, you, you can just imagine that's a recipe for disaster. Now the second way, the second reason you want to keep deflection under control is think again about that tool whipping back and forth. It's a tuning fork. It's vibrating. That means it's likely to generate chatter. And so keeping within the deflection limits is good for both reasons. Now, uh, it's done the recalculation on my scenario, and if I hit save, it's telling me, gee, you can only go a little less than two-tenths of an inch deep uh, on that slotting pass. Now, again, let's, let's cut back our stick out. Let's, let's put more of our tool up in the tool holder, and let's take another look at uh, uh, what we can get. So I hit that. I save it. Yeah. It went up a lot. It's almost three times as deep. Uh, you know, the, the pros already know. They're experienced at it. They know, let's keep the stick out as little as possible. But it's surprising how much a half inch less stick out uh, let us increase our, our depth of cut and, therefore, our material removal rate. I mean, it really made uh, a huge difference to that cut. So that's a cut optimizer. I can go the other way, too. I can, I can say, well... You know, I got a one-inch deep pocket. Uh, you know, what if I wanted to cut that in a single, a single pass? I don't want to have to step down by layers. What's my maximum cut width or step over? Um, and that turns out to be almost the full uh, width of the tool. Okay, somebody asked me how to unlock uh, the value. These little padlocks come up, and what they mean is that value got locked. Uh, the cut optimizer sometimes will lock a value in order to simplify its calculations. And all you have to do is just click the padlock and the lock goes away. Uh, if you enter a value, like I could come in here and go, ah, I want to go 8,500 RPM, uh, and it'll come along and say, okay, well, if you say so, I'll do that. What you want to do is have a look at uh, any of these padlocks and just make sure you agree with it because the padlock is telling you that G-Wizard is no longer in control of that field. All right, so uh, here we are. We're going to do our pocket. It's an inch deep, uh, nearly a half an inch. It's not quite a full slot, but it's got quite a lot of engagement, 91% engagement. Uh, it's telling us, you know, here's our feeds and speeds. You know, we want 5,139 RPM, uh, 30.8 inches a minute. Uh, if we're going to plunge, and of course we're going to discourage you from that, you want a gentler way to uh, enter your cut. It's better to, to helix yourself down, uh, use an existing hole if there's one available, uh, or ramp at the very least. But if you must plunge the end mill directly down, and I certainly hope it's a center cutting end mill if you're going to do that, uh, here's your 10 inches a minute is the rate you should use uh, uh, for your plunge. Uh, I got a question about small end mills. What's the stick out? So stick out is normally the distance from the tool tip to the bottom of the tool holder, where the shank goes into the tool holder. If you got a really small end mill, though, typically uh, it's it's got an eighth inch shank that then necks down to the actual flutes. And uh, what I would use for that, just because the eighth inch shank is so much more rigid uh, than the little tiny flutes, is I would use the top of the tapered area uh, of that shank, which is going to be below uh, the tool holder for sure, but it's going to give you a better look at what your deflection ought to be. Uh, even still, don't get too aggressive. The little, the little tools, the micro mills, Boy, let's talk about micro mills for just a second before I carry on. So G-Wizard uses a completely different set of feeds and speeds algorithms uh, for micro milling, which is anything under an eighth of an inch. And the reason is uh, the tool geometry actually changes at those sizes. What used to be positive rake now becomes negative rake. And uh, the other things that are happening is the little tools are really, really sensitive to run out uh, and tool deflection, and they're easy to deflect. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, 
think about tool deflection as adding to your chip load. Same with runout. Uh, think about that being added to your chip load. And it's really easy to uh, get into a situation if you don't have a really tight machine where those two factors alone mean you just have to take the lightest possible cuts uh, or you're just going to be breaking your little cutters right and left. So uh, just be aware of that. Uh, again, uh, G-Wizard uses a completely different set of uh, feeds and speeds algorithm for micro-milling uh, uh, in order to get a better result. Okay. What else? Uh, here are your limits uh, for what's going on. There's a horsepower limit. There's an RPM limit. Uh, there's a minimum RPM limit, so this is the upper limit, that's the lower limit. Uh, there's a feed rate limit. Those are the most important things to get right on your machine profile. Uh, there's uh, the actual surface speed of the cut you're making, and there's the manufacturer's surface speed. Let's, let's talk about that for a minute. I want to go in and uh, I want to do a quick search. on some cutters so we can bring up a little feeds and speeds table and take a look at that. I just went over here to Niagara's website just because it's really easy to find their feeds and speeds info. All right, recommendations for their top 20. Uh, let's go in. We were messing around with uh, 6061. Uh, and so here's a classic feeds and speeds table. You all have seen these. Uh, a million times and they come through and there's a couple of different tables they have a slot machining and they have a peripheral milling take the peripheral milling one you want the more generous uh, feeds and speeds recommendations uh, and it's telling you uh, uh, depending on the cut so again take the more generous one I would I would take for example either the 600 or the 800 uh, uh, even though I might be cutting at a much, a much more aggressive uh, step over. The reason is G-Wizard will make these adjustments. We just need to know what ballpark this manufacturer wants us to be in. Uh, and so I can enter that information into uh, G-Wizard down here on the manufacturer's uh, uh, surface speed and chip load, and then I'll adjust that information based on the actual cut depth, cut width, the cutting conditions uh, of what's going on. So that's an easy way for you to take advantage of uh, uh, what's going on there. Uh, question about uh, uh, micro-milling. No, there's no pop-up about it. It's just built in, um, uh, built into what's going on uh, in terms of how G-Wizard calculates basically these adjustments to kind of the most optimistic numbers that you get from your manufacturer's tooling catalog. Uh, I had another question about chip thinning. Uh, that's already all built into G-Wizard, uh, both axial and radial. So, for example, if I select a, uh, an indexable tool, I can tell at the lead angle. You know, a 90 degrees is going to cut a square shoulder, uh, but a 45 is a little bit nicer to work with a lot of times. And so, that changes uh, how the chip thinning calculation is done. Uh, or if I go back over to my uh, uh, end mill and I come along and I say, well, you know, this is a half inch uh, end mill, but I want to cut 0.1 uh, on that. So it's going to come back uh, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to do some chip load adjustments down here in order to factor in the chip thinning. So that's all built in. You don't have to worry about that. Uh, we also do button cutters, round cutters. Uh, if you're, if you're, uh, think of a, think of a, a button cutter, uh, which is just a cutter with round inserts as being essentially a bullnosed end mill, right? Where the corner radius is the radius, uh, of your insert. And yeah, we'll calculate the, uh, the thinning on those cutters too, which is really cool. Those are great cutters. Um, so this is telling you the surface speed, the chip load. Uh, this is your your uh, chip load per revolution, the adjustment for the chip thinning. Uh, this is sort of the, the money column over here. What kind of material removal rate am I getting? How many horsepower is this cut going to take? What's my tool deflection and what's the torque 
uh, on the spindle. Uh, a lot of people wondered about this this force, the cutting force calculation, and uh, uh, so I added that eventually. I, I think mostly what it's good for is thinking about uh, your work holding, but you've got to remember that's the torque uh, the spindle is imparting to the tool, and the work holding, let's say you've got a clamp, might be six, eight, ten inches away from where that force is being applied. And what that means is there's leverage happening, right? It's like you've got a 10-inch wrench handle, uh, and you're putting that much torque at one end of the wrench, and it's trying to pop it out from under the clamp at the other end. So a little more, a little more thought is needed than to just use that number directly, but it's there as a starting point. Okay, let's talk about uh, high-speed machining. Uh, you, you've all seen the high-speed machining tool paths. There are those those cool curly Q tool paths that never never force your cutter into a corner. Uh, it turns out that if you run a cutter into a corner, and let me just let me just get a diagram up here for us uh, to look at, so we can see why this is. Uh, we have a feeds and speeds uh, uh, lesson here. That is, uh, I shouldn't say a lesson. It's a tutorial course. Uh, that takes you through uh, a lot of different information uh, on what's going on. And uh, let's see, I think it's in this one. So if you ever want to either look up simple stuff or really complicated stuff, dry machining, that kind of thing, uh, it's all in here. So, for example, you've all heard about rubbing, what's going on with rubbing. If you go, if you run a cutter too slow, it rubs. It actually reduces the tool life. Well, this diagram shows what's happening. You know, with enough magnification, even the sharpest tool has some kind of radius on the cutting edge. And if that radius is small enough relative to the chip load, you get up underneath the chip and you peel it up. Uh, but if the radius is too big, right, the reason it rubs is because you're, you're really more pushing the chip down. You can't get the, the cutter nose up under the chip to peel it off. And so that tool is going to get hot and it's, it's going to have some... Uh, uh, premature chip life issues. Uh, this is the chip thinning that was being talked about. If you do a really light cut, uh, you can see that the geometry of a chip is such that the chip is actually much thinner uh, than with a thicker cut. right? And so you have to actually adjust your feed rate in order to get back to this much chip thickness. And that is what uh, the idea of uh, chip thinning is all about. So as we talk about uh, uh, high-speed machining, uh, what it's all about is uh, what they call a tool engagement angle. Uh, so picture that your end mill uh, here in red is traveling along, cutting the purple material away. And it's, it's moving from right to left. You can see that with uh, half a tool diameter step over, about a quarter of the tool is engaged in removing material until you get to this corner. And then all of a sudden, you got twice as much of the cutter removing material. And depending on your feed rate, the cutting force slams up to twice what it was almost instantly. Um, question about round button cutters. It does apply to round button cutters. All cutters that go into a corner like this uh, are going to increase their, uh, uh, or they're going to increase their 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 load, their force on them, the cutting force a lot, and it happens very suddenly. And so that's why these fancy HSM tool paths, uh, volume mill, and uh, a bunch of different trade names, surf cam, uh, are designed to limit this angle. Call it the tool engagement angle. So it's never greater than whatever that angle is. Well, G Wizard's all set up to deal with that. We can come in here and we can calculate your tool engagement angle. Instead of it being 180, uh, which is what it has to be to start with, uh, we can calculate it. We can say, hey, I have a constant tool engagement angle tool path and I have a step over. What is the actual tool angle? And in this case, it's 53 degrees. And then I can say, hey, uh, what should I do to my feeds and speeds if I'm using that CAM software? So I click that, and what it's going to do is it's going to apply uh, a multiplication factor 
uh, nearly 2x the RPMs, a little over 2x uh, the feed rate, and I can go a lot faster. I can really scream around uh, inside that pocket because I don't have to worry about going into a corner. Um, so that's really cool, and it's really neat to be able to increase our uh, feeds and speeds. That's why people pay so much money uh, in order to have those types of, uh, of uh, uh, tool paths. Okay, we're almost done with this, and then I'll go back to the questions. I just have the last row, two rows actually, the tips row and the cut knowledge base row. So let me go through that really quickly. First, the tips. Uh, these are all those little things that you see in the tooling catalogs, and they just kind of go by, and you hope you remember them, but they're so hard to remember, I finally just decided I'd put them into G-Wizard. And so these are things like, gee, when should I start using parabolic flutes on my twist drill? Or, you know, this is an interesting one. Should I be using climb or conventional milling? Uh, most of the... Uh, most of the uh, machinists I know out there just always use climb milling. Uh, they never try conventional. And it turns out uh, that's a good rule most of the time, but not all of the time. There are uh, circumstances. I just bumped up the cut width to 0.4. Uh, it's an 80% engagement. When conventional milling uh, will deliver better results. And again, remember I was, I was saying how micro milling converts uh, positive rake and a negative rake. Well, same thing happens here when you have too much engagement. And if you, you remember our chip thinning diagram, uh, you can see what's happening is this chip starts to roll over the top of this curve and funny things start to happen. Uh, and so it can be better uh, to use conventional milling for those cases. And G-Wizard will remind you of that. It'll also tell you uh, based on the material, you know, what are the best coatings? If I have a choice of different coated end mills, uh, you know, what should I do? Um, let's talk about the tortoise hair uh, slider. Uh, most machines really like having this. I've recently been adding uh, some more capabilities to it. Uh, and so there's, there's, first change was uh, full tortoise gives what I call a fine finish. And so what I mean by that is it is the absolute slowest you should run that tool in terms of a chip load. It's about 10% above uh, my estimate of where that tool will start rubbing. Um, so that's good to know. That, that doesn't mean you always want to run the tortoise, uh, the full tortoise uh, uh, for finishes. That's your fine finish. Uh, and this is the other thing that's new. It'll be new in this release. So I'm now telling you what do these different positions mean. And so a regular finish is more like that second position. Uh, light roughing would be there. And, you know, full roughing is over here on the aggressive side. Uh, so we were talking about derating uh, de rating mills and different ways to do that for various purposes. Uh, you're, you're certainly welcome to use uh, the tortoise hair slider to do that. A lot of people do. Uh, it's really more intended to arbitrate between roughing and finishing, but there's no harm in using it for that. Uh, another thing you can do is we talked about the machine profiles have the D rating on surface speed and uh, inches per tooth. Uh, again, fine to do that. Uh, if you want to turn that down. There's an old adage, for those of you that have never heard it, which is uh, too many RPMs burn up end mills, uh, too much feed rate breaks an end mill. And uh, so think about it as RPMs will shorten uh, tool life. I guess you could regard breaking an end mill as shortening it as well in a drastic way. But if you're constantly breaking end mills when they're almost new, there's something wrong with your with your chip loads. You need to back that off. And keeping in mind, particularly for hobbyists, that too much chip load could also be a reflection of too much uh, tool deflection, uh, too much machine deflection. If your machine is so light that it bends into the cut for some reason, uh, that's going to be a problem. Uh, and too much run out. I get that a lot uh, from the hobby crowd. Um, I want to show you a quick diagram about uh, 
climb milling versus conventional milling. This is something a lot of people haven't ever seen. Um, this is a diagram showing you the force vector that comes of climb and conventional milling. Uh, so the uh, and the cutter is going around and then back out. And so uh, um, the force vector on conventional, I'm sorry, the conventional is going in and the climb is going in. Note the force vector on the conventional is actually pulling you back out of the cut. Okay, that's kind of interesting. Uh, whereas on climb, depending on what's going on, it's not going to pull you directly into the cut, but there's an element of that vector that's going to pull you deeper into the cut, right? And we all know you shouldn't do climb milling if you have much backlash, because uh, that really can get nasty. But if you think about it, that has several interesting implications. Uh, like, for example, uh, uh, you might consider a lot of machinists have an approach of, I like to do climb milling for roughing because it lowers the cutting forces, but a lot of them will use conventional milling for finishing with a brand new sharp cutter because by pulling it out of the cut, it leaves a little less tool marks. And you just have to try that to see whether it works for you. Uh, on your different jobs, but it's something that's that's very well known and uh, that a lot of machinists will take advantage of. Okay, very last thing, the cut knowledge base. So it turns out that these are all great starting points to, to work from, whether it's CAD CAM Wizard or the Feeds and Speeds Calculator, but you can often go even faster. And, you know, if you're a professional, speed means more money, provided you're not getting too crazy on your tool life. Uh, even if you are sometimes, speed means more money. And the question is, how do you systematically figure out just how fast you can go? And the answer is, use the cut knowledge base. You know, let's say you're going to produce a 1,000 of some part. You know, each setup, when you first get started, you know, start with a starting point, and then each setup, Try increasing the, uh, the chip load or the RPMs 5 or 10% and record those results in your cut knowledge base, right? Uh, the knowledge base can get as big as you want to make it, and you, you tell it all sorts of information. You can give it a, a star rating on, you know, what you thought of the cut. You can say, well, you know, it worked, but it was pretty poor tour life, tool life, or uh, no, 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 it chipped the tool or, uh, you know, uh, no chatter, or, you know, I'm getting a little bit of chatter out of that cut, or, you know, wow, this was terrible, uh, chatter on the cut. Uh, you know, what type of an operation was it? Peripheral milling, pocket slot, whatever. You know, was I finishing? Was I roughing? On and on and on. What was my tool holder? Uh, I had an ER collet chuck. I had a hydraulic chuck, whatever. And over time, what's going to happen is you're going to build up your database of your shop's best practices so that when you go to do a cut and you hit search, it's going to come along and go, well, you know what? The last time you did a cut similar to that, here's what we have in the knowledge base for you. And so lo and behold, uh, you know, if you were able to go 15% more chip load on that cut, it's there for you to see that, that that succeeded in the past and maybe you want to go with that as your starting point uh, in the future. Or Chatter is another interesting one. There's a there's a big section on chatter in our feeds and speeds uh, uh, online tutorial, and what you learn about it is it's repeatable. If it's on the same machine, same type of tool holder, meaning you know a college an ER32 collet chuck that you bought from the same source, same type of tooling. Again, it's a three flute half inch carbide end mill from the same source. And same stick out. Those are the variables you have to watch for. If all of that is held constant, you're going to get chatter at exactly the same spindle RPM. So, you know, you may think, wow, what a bad thing. I've got some chatter. No, what a good thing. I now know what RPM range to avoid for future jobs. Okay, that's everything I have on the demo. Let's go back to the questions. Uh, let me know. Uh, uh, what questions I've missed, because I think I've covered most of these, uh, and I will, uh, 
Ah, the Tormox Super Fly Cutter. <laughs> so fly cutters are easy. Just set them up like uh, indexable tools, uh, but they only have one flute, right? So back it off. The I don't know. I'm looking at a Super Fly Cutter as I'm sitting here. There's one on my desk, and it looks like it's, I don't know, two inches maybe in diameter. It's adjustable. Uh, you know, set up just like that, and it'll come back with your with your feeds and speeds for a fly cutter. Um, other questions? Who else has a question? Kind of ran a little bit over our numbers, but that's okay. So the download for the webinar is on the webinar page. Uh, and I had... This is my fourth one, and only one of them came out so far. But easiest way to find the webinar page, let's see, is uh, at the bottom of most pages. There's a webinar click through, or uh, if you go to the to the help menu, there's a there's a webinar note uh, right here. And so if you go over to the webinar page, let's just do that real quick. Yeah, these are the current webinars. This is the one we're seeing. I haven't scheduled the next G-Wizard one yet. And then these are your recordings, and they download. Uh, and they're pretty good size. may take a little while to download because you got the whole hour. This is now an hour and 20-minute long webinar. Uh, hole cutters. Are we talking about, what, annular cutters, um, rota brooches, those kind of things? Yeah, they're on my list. I don't have them yet. Sorry about that. Yeah, uh, the question is, uh, do the feeds and speeds update uh, for HSM? And you can see as I click this Use HSM button, they're updating quite a bit. Any other questions? Folks, I thank you very much for your time. If you think of a question, feel free to email it to me. My name is uh, Bob Warfield again, and my email is bob at cnccookbook.com. Uh, thanks again, and I uh, hope to see you on the next webinar.